Hey Optimancers, Chris here. Uh, so today I'm going to be presenting a build that makes use of a certain combination that I'll be going over in the build. Uh, but basically the idea is I wanted to make a character that could use the attack action along with extra attack and do things that are more useful than attacking with a weapon using those weapon attacks. Uh, so I will show you how that works in a build that I present called The Tear and Scare. This channel is supported by some amazing patrons. I want to thank some of my top level patrons today. Adam D. Bell, Airhead, Alex Oquendo Vang, Alexander Baldwin, Alex R, Rob Reichelt, Awesome Face, Barbar, Ben Potts, Benjamin, Black, Bloody Nine, Brett McDowell, Atherazone, CJ, Chris Coons, Christian Windham, Unknown Watcher, Kalinta, Daniel Sturgeon, Dank Train, Dash Panther, Dave Peters, David Edgar, and David F. Thank you all so much for your support. If you would like to check out my Patreon, it is linked in the video description. The race we're going with is the Metallic Dragonborn. This is one of the Dragonborn variants in Fizbin's Treasury of Dragons. Uh, so what they're going to get is, for ability scores, they can either choose 3 plus 1s or get a plus 1 plus 2. We'll be doing the latter option. We'll be doing the plus 1 plus 2. As part of this race, we are going to be getting a Breath Weapon. When you take the attack action on your turn, you can replace one of your attacks with an exhalation of magical energy in a 15-foot cone. So this is notably different from the base Dragonborn in that when we take the attack action, we can replace one attack with a breath weapon. Uh, each creature in that area must make a dexterity saving throw. The DC is 8 plus our constitution modifier plus our proficiency bonus. On a failed save, the creature takes a d10 damage of the type associated with your metallic ancestry. On a successful save, it takes half as much damage and increases by a d10 when you reach 5th, 11th, and 17th level. You can use your breath weapon a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. So this breath weapon is definitely better than the base breath weapon that the Player's Handbook Dragonborn gets, uh, because it replaces an attack on the attack action rather than using our action. That's maybe the biggest thing. Uh, but uh, it also scales with our level. Uh, but... There's a couple problems here. First, it is a 15-foot cone. That's not very big. It is going to be hard to get multiple creatures in this a lot of the time. And despite the fact that the damage scales, the damage here is not great. Uh, I mean, at high levels, we're likely doing more with this than a weapon attack. But I mean, at low levels, it's probably doing less than a weapon attack. That is if we're hitting one creature with it. If we're hitting multiple creatures with it, uh, you know, it's probably most or almost all the time going to be better than a weapon attack. We have to be in really close to use this though. This is something we're probably going to be using a little bit at lower levels. At higher levels, we're not going to be using it at all anymore, but it is still vital to our build. We'll just be using it in a different way. Now we're also going to get uh, resistance to a type of damage. All the Fizzbins Dragonborn will get resistance to a type of damage based on their dragon type and I mean the regular Dragonborn do as well. Uh, but basically, we can choose from all kinds of damage, uh, basically all kinds of energy, uh, poison, force, uh, psychic, you name it. You can get resistance to it if you choose that Dragonborn. And any of the Fizzbin Dragonborn work for this build. For this particular build, I've done Gold Dragon, but you can take Gem Dragonborn, you can get Flight that way, that's good. Uh, if you want to do Chromatic, that works as well. Uh, so you can do any of the Fizzbin's Dragonborn, and it will work. This does not work, however, with the Player's Handbook Dragonborn. You have to use one of the Fizzbin's variants. So as one of the uh, Metallic Dragonborn, you get the Metallic Breath Weapon. Uh, this is a 15-foot cone uh, based on our constitution. We get two types of breath we can use with it. The first is an Enervating Breath. This can incapacitate creatures if they fail their save, or we can get a repulsion breath and then they make a strength saving throw, or they're pushed 20 feet away from us and knock prone, uh, and we can use this once per long rest. Uh, this is pretty good. I mean, enervation and repulsion are both pretty dramatic effects. 
Neither of them are based on our best ability score, and it's once per long rest. But like I said, you don't have to use metallic here if you want to use gem or you want to use chromatic. They work pretty much just as well as metallic. The ability scores we're going to start with here, this is using a point buy, so I've put 8 strength, 14 dexterity, 13 constitution, 13 intelligence, 9 wisdom, 15 charisma, and then I've increased 2 scores, uh, constitution increases by 1, so it becomes a 14, and charisma is going to increase by 2, so it becomes a 17. So what I'm presenting here is a 16th level build. I'm going to tell you exactly how you would do this progression to get in my opinion, what would be the most out of it. So starting at first level, we're going to pick up a level of fighter. Fighter is going to give us proficiency in basically any weapon we want and any armor we want. Eventually what we're going to want is half plate, uh, but at first level, you're just going to take probably the scale mail option. Uh, then we're going to get a fighting style. We're going to select archery. Uh, and at first level, I mean, you're going to start with a longbow, so you might as well use the longbow. And then we're going to get second wind, and it is going to give us a healing option as a bonus action. Uh, so archery is really important here, giving us plus two bonus to our attack rolls with that longbow. Now our dexterity is a 14, so we're talking about proficiency bonus of plus two, uh, ability score bonus of plus two, and fighting style bonus of plus two. So we have a plus six to hit. That's not too bad. Uh, and then second wind for a little bit of healing. And yeah, that's basically it. We're going to shoot our longbow. Uh, another thing fighter is going to give us is it's going to start us off with constitution saving throws. And we do want that. The second level we'll take is in warlock. So we're going to take one level of warlock and we're going to pick up the hexblade patron. So what hexblade patron is going to give us at level one First, we're going to get a Hexblade Curse. This gives us a bonus action. We need to be within 30 feet of an enemy. When we use this, we get a bonus to damage rolls against that enemy that equal our proficiency bonus. Any attack we make against that enemy has a critical hit on a 19 or 20. And if that enemy dies, we regain hit points equal to our Warlock level plus our Charisma modifier. Our Charisma is pretty good. And we can use this once per rest. So whether it's a short rest or a long rest. We also get Hex Warrior. First, we get some proficiencies that we already had, but the main thing we're getting here, when we finish a long rest, we can touch one weapon we're proficient with that lacks the two-handed property. When you attack with that weapon, you can use your Charisma modifier instead of Strength or Dexterity for the attack and damage rolls. This benefit lasts until you finish a long rest. If you later gain Pact of the Blade feature, this benefit extends to every Pact weapon you conjure with that feature, no matter the weapon's type. Uh, so. What we need to do now is we had a longbow, we need to switch it out for a hand crossbow. Uh, when we have a hand crossbow, we can use Hex Warrior with it because it lacks the two-handed property. And now we can be using our Charisma to fire the hand crossbow. Uh, so we'll either be firing our hand crossbow or be using our Draconic Breath. Another thing we're going to want to do here, we're not concentrating on anything, so we're going to pick up Hex as a spell. And we'll be adding that to our damage. So it's going to add D6 to our damage. And we'll keep the Hex spell for probably the first four levels of this character. Then we're going to eventually switch it out. But at these low levels, grab Hex, do a little bit more damage. You might as well. At third level, we are going to multi-class into Wizard. And we're going to take Wizard for six levels. Uh, and we are going to go Blade Song. Uh, now, the thing about Blade Song is that... When we get to 6th level, we get a special extra attack feature. That's the whole reason we're doing this, but Wizard is giving us a lot more. The thing we do need to remember, though, is that because we're working off an intelligence bonus of plus 1, if we're selecting, uh, whether it's cantrips or spells, if they have attack rolls, we're, we don't want them because attack rolls, are, we're just likely not going to hit if it's based off our intelligence. Second thing is... If it has a spell saving throw, uh, then we need to think carefully about that as well, because our saving throw DC for wizard spells is going to be much lower than our spell DC for, say, our warlock spells. Now, I will go through the spell selections for wizard and for warlock later in this video. Another thing to note here is that with this particular build, we will get Blade Song and we will not use Blade Song. Bladesong requires that we're wearing light armor. 
So in order to do that, we would end up with a much lower armor class. We don't want a much lower armor class. The second problem with Blade Song is it's largely dependent on your intelligence, and we don't have a stellar intelligence. So Blade Song gives us fewer benefits at a bigger cost, so we're just not going to use it. When we reach fourth level in Bladesinger, we are going to take a feat, and that feat is Dragon Fear. Dragon Fear is one of the racial feats that was in Xanathar's Guide to Everything that wasn't taken very often. It was one of those feats we looked at and we said, you know, it's not bad, but it just wasn't good enough. However, Dragon Fear got a whole lot better after Fizzbins because now instead of replacing a Dragon Breath that requires our action, we can use it with a Dragon Breath that only requires a single weapon attack once we get extra attack. So here's what Dragon Fear does for us. We can increase our Strength, Constitution, or Charisma score by 1 to a maximum of 20. So we'll increase our Charisma here. That gets our Charisma to 18. That helps our weapon attacks. It helps our spell DCs from Warlock. And it is going to help our saving throw for Dragon Fear. Instead of exhaling destructive energy, you can expend a use of your breath weapon trait to roar, forcing each creature of your choice within 30 feet of you. So notice that we now have twice the range and it's no longer a cone uh, and there's no friendly fire. They all make wisdom saving throws and the DC is based on a charisma modifier. A charisma just hit 18. A target automatically succeeds on the save if it can't see or hear you. On a failed save, a target becomes frightened of you for one minute. If the target takes any damage, it can repeat the saving throw, meaning if it doesn't take any damage, it can't repeat the saving throw. It remains frightened. It can't do anything about it. So we want to avoid doing damage to the creatures we frightened, though I should point out that if we do damage, it's not automatically broken. They are only getting an additional saving throw. A thing I'll note is that this does not require line of sight. They have to see you, but you don't have to see them. That means it will work on invisible foes or foes that can see you through magical darkness or whatever. If they can see you and you can't see them, you can still do this just fine. Final thing I want to point out here is there is no additional saving throw unless they take more damage. So once you have them frightened, like I said, you want to avoid doing damage to them because there's really no way to shake this unless they have a way to remove the frightened condition uh, other than saving throws. Now what does the frightened condition do for us? Well, a frightened creature has disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls while the source of its fear is within line of sight. And the creature can't willingly move closer to the source of its fear. And notice that has nothing to do with line of sight. That means a frightened creature can even go run around a corner. Even if they can't see you, they can't come back around that corner because they cannot move willingly closer to the source of its fear. Doesn't matter if it can see you or not. So once we get dragon fear, we will likely no longer use our dragonborn base breath weapon at all. Uh, because, like I said, the damage isn't that great. It's based off our constitution, that's not our best ability score, and it has a small cone, it's hard to hit multiple creatures with that. Here with Dragon Fear, 30 foot radius, excludes our allies. We can use this and it's going to be massively more effective than our breath weapon. Now we'll be able to do it, proficiency bonus times per long rest, and we will be able to combine it with extra attack, which we're about to get. So at 6th level, the Blade Singer gets extra attack. You can attack twice instead of once whenever you take the attack action on your turn. Moreover, you can cast one of your cantrips in place of one of those attacks. So at this point, what we could do is we could do Dragon Fear and we could do a cantrip. Now, we'll have Eldritch Blast through one level of Warlock, but, you know, Eldritch Blast without any enhancements isn't very good. That means we're going to want to go back to Warlock and turn that Eldritch Blast into something special. So with our ninth level, the build comes together. We're going to go back to Hexblade, take a second level. We're going to grab Agonizing Blast and Repelling Blast. So now our Eldritch Blast, since we're ninth level, we're getting two beams. Each one is adding our Charisma bonus. Uh, our Charisma bonus is plus four, also has a good chance to hit. And we're including Repelling Blast. So we can push a creature we hit with that blast by 10 feet. So this is how this build works. Uh, so we have Dragon Fear. This is probably as good as, oh, I'd say a 
third level spell. I mean, it's not concentration. We're frightening enemies 30 feet all around us. No friendly fire. Uh, wisdom save or they're frightened. And there's no additional save unless they take damage. That's really good. Uh, and then normally this would take an action. But in our case, it's not. Uh, because we have extra attack and we can replace one of our attacks, which would be our weapon attack, with the dragon breath. Then we're going to be able to use a cantrip because we have the blade singer version of extra attack, and that will be Eldritch Blast, in which we can combine Agonizing Blast and Repelling Blast, so it's a lot better than a standard cantrip. In fact, warlocks who do Agonizing Blast and Repelling Blast are doing something pretty effective on their turn. But we're doing both. So it's almost like having an action surge on every round we do this. We're going to be hitting creatures with Eldritch Blast, we're going to be pushing them back, we're going to be delivering damage, and then we'll follow that up with the Dragon Fear and potentially frighten those enemies. And if we've pushed those enemies already, they cannot come any closer to us, so we're also keeping them at range. It's just also a really nice combination. At this point, I recommend sticking with Hexblade. There are some different ways we could go with this, but Hexblade, I think, is our best option. We also want to have some good spells. We're going to need Warlock spells, because Warlock spells have that higher DC. So I'm recommending then taking Hexblade to level 5. This will make our character level 12. Now, one thing that will happen at level 12 is, or I should say at a level 11, is we will get one additional beam with our Aldrich Blast. So we're now firing three beams with our Aldrich Blast. We're doing this basically every time we take the attack action. One of our attack action attacks will be with our Eldritch Blast. We're going to get another Eldritch Invocation and we're going to take Improved Packed Weapon. This again is pretty much vital to the build. What we want to do is we want to switch from our hand crossbow to a longbow, but we still want to use our Charisma. Now with Hexblade, as long as our Packed Weapon is a longbow, then we can apply our Charisma Bonus and Improved Packed Weapon allows us to create a longbow using Packed Weapon. So this is Number one, it's going to make our attacks all magical, so if we don't have a magic weapon already, our attacks will be with a magic weapon. Uh, second is, we're going to be taking Arcane Archer, and we want to have a long bow to use with Arcane Archer, so basically it kind of fits everything together. Now, in order for this all to work, we have to take Pack to the Blade, so that's what we're going to take. At fourth level, our ability score improvement will be a feat, and that'll be Sharpshooter. Remember that the Dragon Breath Eldritch Blast combo, that's kind of the main focus of this build, but we can't use Dragon Breath all the time. It is proficiency bonus per long rest. That means a lot of the times we're still going to be shooting a longbow, so we're going to want Sharpshooter there so we can do the minus 5 plus 10, ignore cover, and get the exceptional range. Uh, so we'll be doing the Eldritch Blast slash Dragon Fear some of the time, and then we'll be doing Eldritch Blast slash Longbow Attack, and let's have the Longbow Attack be as good as it can be. And I should mention, of course, because we already have extra attack through Wizard, we don't need Thirsting Blade. Uh, we will already get two attacks with our attack action, so that does us no good at all, and that's what frees up that Invocation slot. Then we're going to go back to Fighter, and we're going to take it to level 3. So what does this do for us? Well, Action Surge is lovely here. Remember how I said that uh, when you combine your Eldritch Blast with Repelling Blast and Agonizing Blast, plus then a Dragon Fear, that's like getting an Action Surge? Well, we can actually double that, right? So if we did that combination, and then we do an Action Surge, then... Uh, you know, we could do another Dragon Fear on creatures that maybe made their saving throw, or maybe we're just burning through legendary resistances, uh, or we could do a weapon attack with Sharpshooter, it's still a good attack, plus we can do another Eldritch Blast. So this is just really more than other uh, characters are able to do in their turn. And the martial archetype I'm selecting is the Arcane Archer. This is an underrated subclass, I did a video about that. Uh, I'll link it above to tell you why Arcane Archer is a lot better than people say it is. Uh, it, but it really all comes down to one thing, and that is Grasping Arrow. So that is absolutely the Arcane Shot option we're going to take first. Grasping Arrow. Now, I've grabbed Bursting Arrow as well. I'll likely never use my other one. 
Grasping Arrow is what I'm going to use all the time. When we hit a creature with our longbow, we apply Grasping Arrow. When the arrow strikes its target, Conjuration Magic creates Grasping Poisonous Brambles, which wrap around the target. The creature hit by the arrow takes an additional 2d6 poison damage. Doesn't matter. If your head is going right now, poison is terrible. Doesn't matter. That damage is almost irrelevant. The best stuff from this arrow has nothing to do with poison damage. Its speed is reduced by 10 feet. Well, that's nice. And it takes 2d6 slashing damage the first time on each turn it moves one foot or more without teleporting. The target or any creature that can reach it can use its action to remove the brambles with a successful strength athletics check against your arcane shot DC. So not a saving throw, not a sure thing, even if they have legendary resistance, this is hard to remove. But even if they can remove it, they've used their action to do so. Otherwise, it's going to last for a full minute. And during that time, the first time they move on any turn, they take 2d6 slashing damage. This is not weapon damage. There are almost no creatures in the game that are going to have resistance or immunity to this damage. It's super reliable. And what can we do? Well, one thing, we have Repelling Blast. We can combine that with our attack action. So we shoot somebody, we Grasping Arrow them, then we Repelling Blast them. They take an additional 2d6 damage. They're further away and they're slowed down. Then your other party members also force movement force movement super common in this game now everyone's got you know the telekinetic feed or repelling blast or their grapplers or whatever uh grasping arrow is going to deliver and deliver and deliver that creature by the time its turn comes up has probably taken several dice of damage then they can just live with it or they can expend their action to try to remove it and that is not a sure thing. You really can't lose with Grasping Arrow. Worst case scenario. Uh, you, so you hit the creature with Grasping Arrow. Maybe you do some poison damage. And it uses its action. It succeeds on its uh, check to remove the effect. Uh, you had no other players using Crusher or whatever to move it. Do any extra damage. Well, it just lost its turn. That's not bad. But more likely... What's going to happen is it's going to take that slashing damage over and over and over again. It's going to either just live with this effect for a full minute, doesn't use your concentration, it can't be dispelled. Uh, and otherwise, they're going to be using actions to try to get rid of it. Uh, and very possibly multiple actions, maybe lose multiple turns. This is one of the most underused features in the game. Uh, way overlooked uh, when people say Arcane Archer sucks. I don't think they have looked closely enough at Grasping Arrow and what can be done with it. This is better than any Battlemaster maneuver. It is very, very strong, delivers a lot of damage, eats up a lot of enemy actions. Uh, twice per short rest, you know, I would love to be able to do it more, but that is still incredibly impactful. Just make sure that when you use Grasping Arrow, you're doing it on the big, tough enemy. Don't do it on minor enemies. This is a big effect, so you want to do it to the big, tough creatures. Finally, we're going to go back to Wizard take two more levels, get our ability score improvement, and get our charisma up to 20. We want those DCs as high as possible for Dragon Fear and for our Warlock spells. Now let's talk about spell selection. So with the Warlock, we're going to have a good charisma, so we don't have to worry. We can go ahead and take spells that require to hit rolls or saving throws. In fact, that's probably what we want. So obviously our first spell is Eldritch Blast. This is primary for this build. Uh, then I picked up Green Flame Blade. Uh, now, I should mention that once we switch to a longbow, uh, we can essentially have two weapons that will rely on our charisma to hit. Automatically, our packed weapon is going to use our charisma bonus to hit, and that will be our longbow. Uh, so we can choose one other weapon that doesn't have the two-handed property and have it uh, be affected by charisma as well. So, you know, grab a long sword or something, and then the attacks from that will come off your charisma as well. I wouldn't be going into melee with a long sword very often, but, you know, it just gives you a little bit of versatility. It, this is definitely a secondary option. Uh, then I grab Mind Sliver, same thing. I'm probably casting Eldritch Blast when I'm using cantrips, but, you know, once in a while, Mind Sliver's all right. I grabbed Darkness, I grabbed Counterspell, Dispel magic, 
Counterspell and Dispel Magic, you want to take through Warlock because you want them to be based on your Charisma. I took Hypnotic Pattern, same thing. Hypnotic Pattern is a good spell, even at high levels. And we want it based off our Charisma, not our Intelligence. So we're taking it through Warlock, not through Wizard. I grabbed Summon Shadow Spawn. Now, the thing about Summon Shadow Spawn is one of the shadows... Well, first off, they have more hit points than your average uh, Tasha's Summon. Uh, the second thing is there's one of the options we get called the Despair Shadow Spawn. And a Despair Shadow Spawn, if a creature other than you starts its turn within 5 feet of the Spirit, it has its speed reduced by 20 feet until the start of that creature's next turn. There's no saving throw against that. And if we were to have a Shadow Spirit beside a creature with Grasping Arrow, that's minus 30 to its movement speed. It may not be able to move at all. And then I grab Thunderstep uh, just as a way to teleport with somebody else. Now with Wizard, I'm grabbing Booming Blade. So I grab Green Flame Blade through Warlock, Booming Blade through Wizard because Booming Blade is not dependent on your ability score. Again, probably not using it very often. Mage Hand, Minor Illusion, Shape Water, just for utility. Uh, we'll pick up our Absorb Elements and our Shield through Wizard uh, because neither of those, of course, are based on our ability scores. We're going to be casting those, of course, regularly as defensive spells. I've picked up Silvery Barbs here. Now, there's lots of DMs that are apparently going to be banning Silvery Barbs. Silvery Barbs also is arguably campaign setting specific. So if you can't take it, then don't take it. It's not uh, essential to this build. And I'm going to pick up Magic Missile. Magic Missile just happens to not rely on your ability score at all and work really well with Hexblade Curse, because Hexblade Curse is adding damage to every missile, uh, and Magic Missile always hits, we can upcast it. So yeah, Magic Missile plus Hexblade Curse, nice combination. Then we'll pick up Misty Step and Vortex Warp with our second level spells. And Misty Step and Vortex Warp, both are teleportations. Vortex Warp we can use on somebody else, Misty Step we can use on ourselves. Then we're going to pick up Fly with our third level spells. Fly is a good spell. It also upcasts well. Arcane Eye will pick up with our fourth level spells. Also a good spell and useful and is not going to be reliant on our intelligence. And then Wall of Fire. Now Wall of Fire we need to talk about. Technically Wall of Fire is reliant on intelligence but to a very small degree. So the thing to note about Wall of Fire, we all kind of understand. It creates a wall, it's made of fire. Uh, but when the wall appears, each creature within its area must make a dexterity saving throw. This will be based on a low DC. On a failed save, the creature takes 5d8 fire damage or half as much on a successful save. So against that initial saving throw, our intelligence does matter. Though the difference isn't going to be huge. But here's the thing. One side of the wall, selected when you cast a spell, deals 5d8 fire damage to each creature that ends its turn within 10 feet of that side of the wall or inside the wall. A creature takes the same damage when it enters the wall for the first time or ends its turn there. The other side of the wall deals no damage. This has no saving throw. So what we want to do is we're going to take advantage of our combinations here. We'll place walls of fire behind enemies. We'll Eldritch Blast them into the wall. And then they take damage from the Eldritch Blast. They take damage from the wall. And then they're on the wrong side of the wall. Now keep in mind, if we have creatures frightened, we don't want to target them. We want to target the creatures that aren't frightened. Because creatures that are frightened of us, we don't want to deliver damage to them. Or they're going to get another saving throw. Now the Terran Scare, this is the issue with the Terran Scare. There are a couple levels where this character is going to feel like you're falling a little bit behind. Where this one really kind of hurts is, I'd say level 5. Because at level 5... Other characters are getting extra attack. They're getting third level spells. We're not. Uh, at this point, we're getting second level spells, and we don't even have good spell DCs. Level 6 and level 7 also don't feel great here. So level 5, 6, and 7, those are the character levels where, like if I was doing a one-shot, I'd never make the Terran Scare for a level 5, 6, or 7 game. Level 8, things start to come together because we're getting extra attack, uh, but... At this point, we're playing catch-up. Where we really feel this character come into play is level 9. That's when we get our second level of Hexblade. Now we are combining our Eldritch Blast with uh, a long-range attack or 
combining Eldritch Blast with our Dragon Fear effect. Combining those two together is kind of the point here. And our bonus action is available so we can set up our Hexblade Curse as well. So level 9, this starts to do really well. And it is going to continue to do well right through level 16. Now I'd say by level 17 again, once other characters are getting 9th level spells, we, there's nothing we can do here that really compares to a 9th level spell. Uh, so yeah, 17th level. Again, if you were playing a one-shot, I'd just play a straight caster. Get that 9th level spell. But in a campaign where you're going to find this character does okay is levels one through four, then five, six, and seven, it's going to be uh, feeling like you're a little bit behind. Level eight, it'll start to feel like you're catching up. Level nine comes together, and it's going to perform really well from levels nine through level 16. So that's the Terran Scare. Hope you enjoyed it. I promise in my next build, I'll actually make a Blade Singer that uses Blade Song. Uh, this was just a combination that I thought that was kind of interesting, that if we could combine Dragon Fear along with the Blade Singer extra attack. Now, the thing about Dragon Fear is it uses Charisma, and Blade Singers normally are using Intelligence. So what we had to do here is just kind of focus on our Charisma and just have enough Intelligence to get that extra attack feature, and the attack feature itself doesn't require Intelligence. And I just wanted to present that because I thought it was an interesting combination. Uh, so, otherwise, until next time, gonna sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon.